Ladies and gentlemen, uh, and I meant that too. Okay, we're about ready to launch the program. I guess we'll get started. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to tonight's event celebrating the 20th anniversary of the USC Wrigley Institute for Environmental Studies. We've got a unique program this evening uh, that features uh, the Wrigley Institute's inaugural director, Dr. Tony Michaels, and our current director, Roberta Marinelli. Uh, this evening, they'll be providing us with glimpses of uh, the Institute's founding and a roadmap for its future, including insights into current research projects on Catalina Island, as well as at the USC main campus. And it's all ranging from aquaculture to alternative energy. I'm Phil Hagenau, and I'm the chair of the USC Wrigley Institute Advisory Board. And thank you, LA Yacht Club. This is really, this is, this is just wonderful. This is a spectacular place. Thank you. And uh, now, be before we begin, I, I want to, uh, we all want to have a special thank you to Nancy Fine and Len for hosting this wonderful event. At this thank you. Thank you guys. So, this is neat. I'd also like to introduce uh, our advisory board members, of which just about all of them are here tonight. And uh, I'll start with um, the longest advisory board member who's been here for the full 20 years, and that would be Maria Pellegrini. <laughs> and our newest advisory board member, Bruce Kessler, and his wife, Jim. And uh, Andrew and his wife Karen, a little fair. I think they just, uh, good to see you. <laughs> Brock Dewey here is with us tonight. Brock, thank you. J.R. Johnson, there we go. And Ann Muscat. Vice Dean of Social Sciences at USC, and Carla Heidelberg, who's the Director of the Environmental Studies Program. And also Rob Woolley, our Chair of Development. facilities to advance marine research. When Bill Wrigley, Phil's son, and his wife Julie founded the USC Wrigley Institute for Environmental Studies in 1995, they greatly enhanced the program to include a broader portfolio of environmental research and education. That includes policy, behavior, and communication. The mission of the Wrigley Institute speaks to their shared visions. 
to encourage responsible and creative decisions in society by providing an objective source of marine and environmental science and fostering an understanding of the natural world among people of all ages. At this point, I want to invite my cousin, Allison Wrigley Rusak, to share more of the important uh, highlights of, the, of uh, this wonderful 20th anniversary. Uh, Lee actually graduated from Stanford. So she, went to, she went to work at Disney. Uh, she's, um, I used to carry her around at Thanksgiving and Christmas dinners like a football under, under my arm. And we, we've uh, had many fun moments. She's, she's married to Jeff Rusak, who's here. They have three great sons. And uh, they make some very good wine, too. <laughs> and Lee is also on our board. So would you please welcome Lee Rusak. Thanks. I've been uh, suffering from a split identity all my life because in, in our family, um, everyone is named Philip or William amongst the boys, and all the girls are named after their mother. So my mother's name is Allison, and so is mine. Our grandmother was Helen, our cousin's Helen. My brothers are Phil and Bill. My father was Bill. <laughs> it, it just goes on and on. So hence the nickname Lee, because my mother became Allie, and she didn't want to be Big Allie. <laughs> Old Allie and young Allie. And so, so that's why uh, my family calls me Lee. I thought I'd better explain, because my name changed completely from the beginning of my introduction to the end. Anyway, um, I don't remember being carried around like a football. <laughs> I'm guessing you, you must have uh, given me some of your Chardonnay while you were at it. Uh, to sort of, never complained. Uh, no, uh, definitely not. <laughs> anyway, tonight we're here to celebrate the, the great strides that have been made uh, in environmental research, education, and conservation. Uh, at the Wrigley Institute and the Wrigley Marine Society, Marine Science Center. Apparently that's genetic. But <laughs> be, before we get to all the complex and cool stuff, which I'll let the scientists explain, uh, it's interesting when I try to explain to people how my family got into uh, trying to conserve the environment and uh, this whole movement worldwide, it all started with a small island in the Pacific. <laughs> and that, that's truly what happened. From the first moment uh, they laid eyes on Catalina, Phil's and my great-grandparents, Ada and William Wrigley Jr., vowed to preserve Catalina's beautiful and pristine landscape and to share its unique wilderness with others. They had a passion for Catalina, just like all of us here, and that passion has been passed down um, probably a little bit by osmosis and a lot by just talking about Catalina and experience it, experiencing it over the years. It has been passed to every succeeding generation including Phil's and my children, which would make that the fifth generation. And, uh, and Phil's kids have kids, so uh, it's going on the sixth. They're just a little too little. He's still carrying them around like footballs. <laughs> so so uh, I, I also kind of explained how uh, the USC connection came about as uh, one of the classic great development relationships. So uh, I'm sure Rob appreciates that. Um, some 50 years ago, our, our grandfather, Philip K. Wrigley, met Dr. Norman Topping of USC and found in him and the school a strong partner who saw the value of supporting the environment through studying and preserving 
Catalina's amazing undersea and shoreside ecosystems. And so it was the foresight of USC, as well as uh, our family, to get this off the ground 50 years ago before it was cool or important or an emergency or anything um, to get going on the uh, working on the environment. And that collaboration, as you all know, resulted in the Marine Science Center at Two Harbors. And then three decades later, my father, uh, William Wrigley, wanted to take that concept even further, and times had changed. And so it became a broadened in scope. It began to include the terrestrial uh, part and to also include more global issues such as ocean water quality and how it affected uh, or was affected by urban runoff and things like that. He was also very much a proponent of improving the facilities which he did at that time and uh, you know it, it, we are we were just talking about that again today. <laughs> it's funny how these things just keep coming around. In the 15 years since I joined the advisory board, I have been amazed, proud, and sometimes a little afraid of the sharp and talented people associated with the Institute. Faculty, students, uh, we've seen numerous presentations and heard from, uh, from the administrators, the board members, it's, it's so exciting. This is a one-of-a-kind program. Uh, it offers a tremendous opportunity uh, to not only research and care for the natural environment, but also look at the similarities and differences in the urban environment to which it's connected, just 20-something miles across the sea. I say 20-something because there's been lots of controversy over the years as to whether that song was actually correct or not. So it's 20-something. Anyway, it's, it really is uh, something that no one else has because Catalina is close to USC, but it's such a different world. And the two worlds, downtown LA and, and uh, the islands, have a lot to teach us if we, if we look carefully and they also have, once we learn things from them, they have the ability to be applied to the rest of the world. How do you have such a pristine island environment, uh, you know, coexist with a, a hustling, bustling, very crowded um, urban environment so close by? That's something that, uh, that we spend a lot of time talking about at the Conservancy, too. So there's, there are a lot of people trying to work on this problem, and it's really, it's, it's a real testament what has been accomplished here. So I look forward to seeing what all these bright minds come up with in the next 20 years. And now it is the fun part, hearing about the vision and the adventures along the way in the past and the present, and ideas and dreams for the future from two people who are not only impressive scientists, but also very entertaining. <laughs> Which I didn't know was possible until I met you guys. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> Dr. Anthony Michaels, or Tony, is a nationally recognized leader in environmental science, innovation, and sustainability, and of course was the inaugural director of the Wrigley Institute for Environmental Studies. Uh, Tony came to USC in 1996 from the Bermuda Biological Station for Research, not a bad place to come from. Not a bad place to stay either. <laughs> so we're lucky we got him and he immediately distinguished himself by having a roof wedding ceremony where he poured rum on the roof of the new center. Some people christen things with champagne but Tony, uh, Tony used rum so. Anyway, 
Um, it's just too hard to digress when I look at you two. <laughs> anyway, during, uh, he, let's see, what did he study when he was in Bermuda besides rum? Ah, he studied <laughs> carbon and nutrient cycles. I guess that could, that could work either way. <laughs> during, during these formative years, he was instrumental in establishing the Wrigley Institute as an interdisciplinary home for environmental scholarship across USC. His efforts helped make the Institute's research relevant, usable, and understandable to decision makers in society, including business and governments. And I'm sure Tony will share more on that later. Since leaving the Wrigley Institute, when he ran out of rum, Tony, <laughs> Tony continues to build, has continued to build a successful business career, and is currently chief executive officer of Midwestern BioAg, uh, and leading a team that will expand the reach of that company. It's a leader in biological agriculture and a pioneer in sustainable food production. And he's moved to the garden spot of Madison, Wisconsin. <laughs> he is chair of the board for the National Council for Science and the Environment and serves uh, as a benefactor member of the Catalina Island Conservancy and on the board of the Global Institute on Sustainability at Arizona State University. He has previously been chair of the Council of Environmental Deans and Directors and the NSF Advisory Committee on Environmental Research and Education. He earned his BS and MS degrees from the University of Arizona. Go Phil. Uh, Phil did, yes, Phil went there too and his PhD from UC Santa Cruz. In the past 30 years, he has published 100 scholarly papers. So that is Tony's bio. I'll ask you to hold your applause or your uh, standing ovation because now we have Roberta. Um, our current director, Dr. Roberta Marinelli, came to USC and the Wrigley Institute in 2011 from the US National Science Foundation an agency that invests $7 billion a year in fundamental and translational research that advances our nation. And that's, that's where the ability to communicate in an understandable way is crucial. Obviously, $7, $7 billion and the government, you've got to, you know, you've got to figure out how to bridge that gap. <laughs> While at the NSF, she played a leadership role in developing a portfolio of competitive grant programs related to climate change and sustainability, and in particular, ocean, ocean acidification, over and above her day job of awarding and overseeing research grants in oceanography and ecology in Antarctica and the Southern Ocean. She earned her PhD from the other USC, South Carolina, <laughs> and has served on the faculty of the University of Georgia and the University of Maryland, where she also received an NSF career award for promising young scientists. Was that when you were being carried around like a football? <laughs> In addition to her duties as director of the Wrigley Institute, Roberta serves as an advisor to the National Research Council on Federal Priorities for Scientific and Sustainability Research. She is the Vice President of the Board of Trustees for the Consortium of Ocean Leadership, a group of leading universities with ocean research programs. She is the President of the Board of Directors of the Southern California Marine Institute and Co-Chair of the Dornsife College's sustainability task force you know I have to say introducing scientists is almost worse than reading Bible names in church <laughs> too many big words anyway we are truly lucky 
to have both of them here tonight, ladies and gentlemen, Tony Michaels and Roberta Merrill. <laughs>
So let's think about a little bit about what 1995 was like when this idea for the Wrigley Institute came into, into being. Um, you had a situation where the Cold War had ended. And for a long time, the military paid all the bills on the sides. Huge amounts of money flowed into Green sides, all stepping back from uh, the battle for Tarawa on uh, a small island in the Pacific where the, the battle was well planned, it was a simple island, it should have been easy to take, and when they rolled the landing craft ashore, they got stuck on a reef two miles offshore <coughs> in this low tide. And they didn't know what the tide was, but the most predictable thing on the planet. And 2,000 Marines died unnecessarily because they didn't know when the tides were. And the Navy swore it would never again have an unknowable thing about the ocean, a knowable thing about the ocean being unknown because no one had ever looked. And so they started pouring huge amounts of money into marine science. And that really built a lot of these marine science programs, uh, USC's program, the program at Scripps, which hold all the big ocean graphics. And USC was a critical <coughs> component of that growth. But then the Berlin Wall falls, Cold War's over, and basically there didn't seem to be any enemies that required that kind of knowledge anymore. We learned a lot in the 30 years from World War II. And so the money just dried up. And all of a sudden, all these big programs and big expensive infrastructure going, holy cow, what do we do now? At the same time, you also had another evolution in universities where in the 70s, there was this thing that kind of happens right around this time of the year, Earth Day. And there was this enlightenment about what the state of the world's environment was and how we had to sort of do something about it. And universities started creating environment programs. And the early ones were all activist centric programs. They were about creating the environmental activists of the future and really going changing things. And then in the 80s, they started evolving a little bit into usually geology departments and geography departments were sort of grab hold and they become sort of the science home of some of the environmental scholarship. But there was this sense that something was missing in what environment programs needed to be, that they had to be more than what they had, uh, had evolved to uh, historically. And that of evolution was sort of going on. There was this casting about what is the model for how we study the environment and what is the difference between a science program and an environmental program? The difference is who cares about the science, right? If the only people that care about the science are other scientists building fundamental research, that's science. But if the people that care are all of us, because we need to use that stuff to do things differently, you know, the planet that we deserve and our grandchildren deserve, that's an environmental science. It's the connection of that science to the, 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 the questions that we all face and the challenges that we have on this planet. And so that was sort of casting about, but nobody kind of had figured out, how do you get this done? And we also had this issue that marine labs had sort of lived a, a little bit of a subsidized model, shall we say. And part of the magic of what we had done, excuse me, it's like, <laughs> Part of the magic of what we'd done in Bermuda is we made a marine lab that was profitable. And that's kind of a little bit unusual in academia. But, you know, it was necessary. We were a small private marine lab. We had no other backup. There was no tuition. You had to make it work. And so uh, I was out at USC actually giving a seminar. And because uh, and, uh, a couple of people at USC were working out at a marine lab in Bermuda. And they asked me to give a seminar. And this lady corners me afterwards and drags me and sets me down in this conference room for, I don't know, how many hours. And Maria was sitting there just peppering me with all these questions. You know, what is it that you guys do? How does that work? How did you make that thing work? And, and you know, like, I like talking about these kinds of things. So I would talk about what we did, what we did, what we did. And, and, and what we did was basically build a different business model around a marine life. You got all these places you create value. Some of it's the science. But if you're doing, people care about the ocean. You know, people love the sea. People love the, the living things that are in the ocean. People love our planet. And if you're doing work that can make that better, people care. And there are ways that you can turn some of that into passion, but you can also turn some of that into a business model where you can get find places where people will pay for some of that value, whether it's teaching, whether it's research, whether it's outreach, whether it's other kinds of, of, of ways that you connect. There's a business model that you can create. And so, a little bit after that conversation, we started dancing around with what this thing is, and then Allison's dad and, 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 and uh, Steve Sample and, and Morty Shapiro, the, the dean of the time, sort of got together and said, you know, what is it that we could put together? And, and I think Bill drove them very hard. <laughs> Pulled the backroom pressure. He was a trustee, you know, he was Steve Sample's boss, and so he wanted to make sure things happened. And, uh, and this plan came together about how do you take this marine lab and use it as the catalyst to solve some of those challenges 
What is the future of the scholarship of the sea? What is the future of how we care and use science to make a better planet? How is the, what's the future of the governance and operational model for universities that can allow these things to work and function and have a long-term sustainability? And, uh, and that then came together around the, the, the vision for the Wrigley Institute. And, and I was lucky to be chosen to be the, the, the first director of that. And, and it was one of the you know, proudest moments of my, my day, my, my life. And, uh, and I think it's still one of the things I'm most proud of, of having done. And, and, and still, I think I'm doing the Wrigley Institute work in the work that I, did, do, that I do today. And, uh, and so we got together. And, and uh, Allison's family was very generous in getting us started. We, Packy was very generous. Packy was fun. Allison's dad would pay for big vision things. Packy knew that to make it work, the sewage plant had to work. You know, all of the infrastructure had to work. It was the only person you could go to that fixed the sewage plant. You know, I mean, this is the, you know, Packy also had this sense that no, I, I, all, people, other people could do the big vision stuff. You got to make it work, and I'm going to help with those things. And it was, it was really fun to, to sort of work with different, different perspectives and different, different parts of the family. So we came together and, and, and started putting the Wrigley Institute together. And the idea was to take this incredible jewel on the island and all the capacities on the mainland at USC and actually the whole network of universities and schools and other things that are part of Southern California, one of the most populated places with the biggest passion for the sea, and put that all together and come up with a new model for where science fits in, where universities fit in, where knowledge turns into action how we can use that island as a catalyst and as a model uh, for changing things. And, uh, and we did a whole variety of things. We built a lot of infrastructure. We renovated uh, a, a lot of buildings. We poured some rum on some roofs. It's a Bermuda tradition. That's how you, in Bermuda, your water is collected from rainwater, and it goes into a cistern under your building. And it's just sort of a thing that you, you season the roof when you open a new building, because that rum is going to run into your cistern, and you're going to get it back. And uh, uh, the, uh, so that's where the treasure is. And you know, you gotta, any tradition that involves alcohol, you got to borrow. <laughs> Such a wonderful thing when Allison and Jeff bought the uh, wine. <laughs> so, the, um, um, so some of it then was building the infrastructure that it takes to take the, the lab to the next generation. And I think that's even continued after I left. You know, there's, new science, new questions require new infrastructure, uh, but also the people that need to come and enjoy that experience require infrastructure. And that's where the Boone Center and the upgrading of the uh, housing accommodations and the expansion of the, of, of, of the different housing it was all part of the business model. People pay for room and board. When you bring them together, there's certain places where you can generate revenue and certain places where you can generate incredible ideas. You can put both of those together. Uh, we also hired a lot of people. And, uh, and that was, I think, the most exciting thing. I, some of these people were in the room today. And, and, uh, and it was just fun to go out there and think, what's the kind of team that you want to put together that can really address some incredibly important questions? And whether it's the future of fisheries, uh, whether it's the future of, of aquaculture, whether it's, do you want to go swim at the beach after it rains? You know, do you care if the water quality in your beach, near that storm drain or that river, uh, is safe enough to swim in? Uh, what about this ocean and its effects on global climate change and the, the amount of carbon dioxide that ends up in the atmosphere? Uh, you know, those were the kinds of questions that we set out to explore, and we started putting teams of people together, and, and, uh, and uh, we did luckily have some pretty impressive deans along the way that were willing to go out there and hire a lot of people. And one of the biggest things we did was this cluster hire, where we just hired a self-organizing group of, it turned out to be seven people, that all came together, and John and some of the other folks that were in that group were here, where they came together around a big idea and pitched the whole group and their idea. And it was sort of this geobiology, geobiology environmental microbiology, this whole idea that microbes are everywhere. And you hear it, today you hear it about with the gut, right? Everybody knows about all these studies of all these microbes that are living in our bodies and all the amazing stuff it does. Well, the Wrigley Institute was way ahead of that because the rest of the world is like that. And all the things that happen on this planet act like that. And to study, you gotta get out there and you gotta sequence whole ecosystems rather than just one organism at a time. And you gotta understand the dynamics of those ecosystems. It's the same thing that, the, that they do now in the gut. But we pioneered that through this geobiology. And geobiology, I think, was one of the, is one of the amazing things that the Wrigley Institute was able to do. Great group of faculty in that area. So the interact, interaction between life and rocks, all the organisms that make rocks or eat rocks or breathe rocks to make a living. And they're all over the place and they do all kinds of amazing things. Uh, um, and so we brought this group of faculty together, but it's not enough to 
you just have a group of faculty that do a clever thing. You gotta have a lot of other faculty and a whole community of people across all universities that do this. And so with the support of the Agron Institute, we funded a course. And every year, 20 students from around the world and 20 faculty from around the world would come together for six weeks on the island. And the island was critical because not only was it a great laboratory for doing the work, they were all stuck in the same place, <laughs> bonding to each other. Because any young person that's going on in science, eventually the faculty ones have to get tenure. And that means that some old person has to understand what they do and think it's worth doing. And how do you get those old people to change their mind? It's, it's a hard thing. And so we would bring those old people out on the island, liquor them up, and have them <laughs> And we put these amazing programs together, and, and, uh, and, and we just had these incredible times. Probably should talk about the liquoring up. That's illegal now, isn't it? Uh, universities have changed. Uh, but the, um, um, but you sit around the can, you know, the, 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 the patio at night, playing guitars and singing, and you know, this whole bonding thing. But then all day long, this incredible, deep intellectual thought about things nobody ever thought about doing, and these cross-disciplinary ways of thinking that, 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 that were just being invented right there. Everything from the early evolution of life to life on other planets to why your teeth get plaque. You know, I mean, why you get heart disease. I mean, it's this incredible spectrum that you can all talk about together. But we created that generation of old faculty who could tenure these young faculty. And now some of those first faculty are full professors at great universities, and they're the ones writing the tenure letters for the next generation in geobiology as a field. But it came about because we created a course and a vehicle for creating a whole field on the island. And it was a field that was important to us in the ocean, but it was also something that you can only uniquely do at a place like the Rico Institute. And there were exciting things like that. There's a whole variety of other projects. I am long-winded, so they could, they, could, they could keep on going. Uh, but it's a very exciting way to sort of rethink how science works and to rethink about how science makes a difference. We were part of the creation and leadership of the Council of Environmental Deans and Directors, which is now 160 universities, all basically following the Wrigley Institute model. And we were sort of one of the first programs to really try and stitch all those pieces together, lay a framework, show a model, make everybody jealous because we had a business model too and there was money associated with it. I mean, it was uh, amazing how, how, how important that was in getting people to, uh, to also want to follow. And so it was a very, very exciting path and there's a lot of different research, a lot of it still continuing and I think that, that Roberta will talk about it. And, uh, and one of the people that I think throughout the whole thing was really critical to, to our success uh, and still is, is Anne Close. She was there at the very first day. Amazing. The people that said I did a lot of stuff, but everybody else that was close enough knew that, you know, I just stood up there and talked. And <laughs> <laughs> Anne was a really, really, where all the successes really came from. And so the, um, and so then uh, about what, six, seven years ago, I, I, uh, I, I moved on, uh, started a series of companies, and. And, uh, and I actually run a farming company now. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's you know, people will say, how on earth did you go from oceanography to farming? And now we're not an average farming company. It's a transformative model for how we feed the planet. Um, but really, it's actually pretty simple. Because when you think about what we do, is we really understand the geobiology of soils. And we understand how the life of the soil feeds the plant. We understand how plants are the, the ecosystem that produces our crops is really a tightly knit microbial food web, just like the ocean. And the productivity of those plants is determined by the availability of trace minerals, which is just exactly like the ocean. It was a weird thing the first time I ever heard about this. They, they were telling me what was going on, and I was finishing their sentence. They said, how on earth can you finish the sentences? You're not a farmer. You don't know anything about this. You're, you're a faculty member, for crying out loud. Faculty members are the enemy of, of practical farmers. It's like, no, no, but if an oceanographer was asked to describe how farming should work, they would describe what you guys do. And it turns out it's all the stuff that everybody else misses. And actually, oceanographers missed it for a long time, and we're just ahead in figuring it out. And so it's been fun to go out there and, and, and build this company um, but in many ways, I feel like I'm still doing the mission of the Wrigley Institute. Because what we're about, we're about learning new stuff and finding a way to change the planet, to change our lives, to improve our health, to improve the conditions for our children and grandchildren. And that's really the companies that we created when I was on the private equity side. They all fit that model. The, the Midwestern bioag, this transforming food, is sort of the biggest problem I think that I can help uh, influence right now. But it's the same model, it's the same model for what the Wrigley Institute does. 
do the scholarship that matters, and then figure out how you make it matter. Figure out how you actually change the world with that, with that tool. And for these, I chose to and actually get out there and do it. I mean, someone's got to do it, and so, so if not, not, not me, and so on, so on, uh, so, uh, so it's an exciting thing, but I'm just still so incredibly proud to watch the continued evolution and growth of the Wrigley Institute and the amazing things that everybody continues to do. It's one of the most special things on this planet. Catalina, of course, is, a, is an amazing tool. So thank you very much, and now the... I think we're on? Great. Um, so before I get started, uh, I have to give a very serious nod to Tony um, for helping to build a fantastic institute, um, for being willing to take the time when I first came to Southern California from the East Coast, you know, in a, not only a new environment for me, but walking into what was this really wonderful uh, collaboration between a family and and really helping me understand that dynamic and giving me great lessons in how to work within it and how to be successful. So um, let's give Tony another round of applause. He gave to me um, and because he left great things for me to work with and also showed me the possibility that there are many more great things to come. And so as he said, I have the hard job of talking about Future. Um, but before I get too deeply into the future and, and think too seriously and talk too much about those complex things that Allison alluded to, that three or syllables or more, um, I want to go back to something that's really pretty simple and talk about some very basic environmental problems that you're probably all aware of. So let's think about something simple like acid rain. I think everybody probably remembers what it was. Uh, it was a problem that was created when fossil fuels that have sulfur and nitrogen associated with them uh, spew that into the atmosphere as they're combusted through um, not just um, factories but also our cars. And that created this problem called acid rain because when they combine with water and they're deposited onto the ground, it creates acidic conditions that are harmful to life. And we figured that out, we figured out the relationship, we figured out with investment that we could actually capture the noxious particles, not the carbon dioxide, unfortunately, not yet, but we figured that we could capture these particles and we could greatly diminish this very difficult problem that was causing um, streams and rivers in the Northeast to suffer serious um, biological losses. And so it's a nice success story in the sense that we figured out the problem, we figured out a technology, it was, it was partly through science, it was partly through policy, and we have a success. And I think any of you who were here for our kickoff campaign remember the story about the ozone hole. It's another great success story where uh, we knew that ozone in the stratosphere was thinning, we couldn't figure out why, and then the scientists who won both the, the Tyler Prize and the Nobel Prize figured out that it was the uh, freon in our refrigerants that was entering the atmosphere and causing ozone destruction and putting life on our planet um, in harm's way because of the ultraviolet radiation that was let through. So we figured out we need different uh, replacements, we put them in, and now the ozone hole is thickening up and it's not the problem that it used to be. So we've caused some serious problems and we've solved some serious problems. But what the think the message that I want to send this evening is that the world that we're living in now is a quite a bit more complicated in terms of our environmental challenges than some of those simple successes would have indicated um, 20 or 30 years ago. And I think that if, if there's a, a call to action this evening, it's to really try and understand what those complexities are and to train the next generation to think about them, to wrap their minds around them, to understand the interconnections between our natural environment and our human systems and move forward in a much more sort of collaborative and collective way, built very much on the model that Tony's described about how sciences through collaboration can solve new problems. We now have to broaden our sense of what collaboration is in our institutions and in societies in order to, um, in order to figure out how to make progress in an increasingly complex and environmentally challenged world. Um, so 
I want to give a couple of examples of why I think that's the case, and I want to make a connection to this term called globalization. So everybody's heard about globalization. We know that our societies are interconnected. We know that our commerce is in interconnected. And we have to think about the natural environment in the same way. Our air and our water um, are interconnected. The carbon dioxide that we put out into the atmosphere flows all over the planet. It flows into our ocean. It flows into ice at the poles. And it gets recorded in the, in the records. Um, <clears throat> and we've sort of, we've made, because we use our natural resources, because they're embedded in our production and our commerce, then our movement and our productions of goods and resources are as globally interconnected. And so we're basically moving them around through our human systems as well as our natural systems. So <clears throat> let's take an example of something like energy. So every time we use energy, we not only create some environmental problems through carbon dioxide, um, we know that carbon dioxide influences global climate, we know that that also influences weather in our local um, environment, and we know that it, it influences our local air quality. We, we're, we're in the port of Los Angeles, so that's pretty obvious. But every time we use energy, we're also using water, which is another really constraining resource in Southern California. So, you know, at its extreme, hydropower has to have water. You can't have energy without it. Fracking requires water. It can, be, it can use reclaimed water, but it still requires water to pump fuel out of rocks. Even photovoltaic cell production requires water. And so they're intimately connected, and they're both very limited. And if you flip the equation, it also takes energy to produce water, whether you're taking it from a mountain reservoir, um, or whether you're trying to take the salt out of water so that you can drink it, which is something that we're very seriously considering. That's highly energy intensive. Um, and it also takes water even just to pump, uh, or it takes energy even just to pump water from the very cleanest reservoirs. And so we have to think of these two resources as very interconnected. And in the science world, we call this the energy water nexus. And so we can't really think about one without thinking about the other. And that's sort of complexity element number one. And now I'm going to move a little bit into Tony's world because if you add food production to that, then you have this sort of energy, water, food nexus, because almost every form of energy we produce, intensive agriculture, animal husbandry in particular, takes lots of energy and lots of water. And food production, as we all know, has a very significant influence on our global circulation of nutrients and carbon. So there we go again. We're coming full circle with this energy and water and food relationship, and we depend on all of them. And then I'm going to take it one step further, and then I'm going to stop. Because <laughs> your head might be exploding, and I really don't want to do that, because I want to paint a bright picture at the end. But I want you to think about the human supply chain. Every time we export something like lumber or food, we're exporting the resources that are in those products. And we're moving them around pretty rapidly. In the port, we see ships come and go, or they line up for a really long time and get charged really big fees. But every time we do that, we're also moving our resources. And in, in California, we import water to grow food, but every time we export food, we're exporting that water. And so all these things really, really matter. And these are at the root of how we have to think about our environmental challenges for the future. So I agree. 100% that creation of the Institute 20 years ago really came at the right time because it emphasized the cross connections on our main campus and it also built on the intellect that was brought by um, the Wrigley Marine Science Center and a lot of the stellar faculty that were already here. And so, you know, what we have to do going forward is we have to look at our environmental challenges from all of these multiple dimensions and use all of the university's brain power, its faculty, its students, and the people who are really willing to bring those collaborations together um, and to start solving those problems. So I think, you know, it's a fascinating intellectual challenge. And, you know, when you get deeply into it, it involves not only how you know, nutrients and elements work, but it's how people behave and whether you can model different behaviors and whether you can 
sort of incorporate or ask the question about is the size of a community right for trying this particular approach to solving a problem or, um, or creating a different structure and, and policy in which um, new, new regulations might work. And so it brings together math and social sciences and psychology, and it's really a lot of fun for those of us who like to think about problems as being fun, but it's also an imperative for the planet. And that's where what Tony says is that it really matters, and that's where it comes into play. And so what's the future of the Wrigley Institute? It's that we have to grow bigger, and we, we are, and we've always been that way, but we have to continue along that path because it's not just about biology and natural science, but it's about behavioral economics and business and big data. And really, this sort of big system view, not just in the earth and climate and all of the elements within it, but also all of the human systems and the structures, because they're all very, very interconnected. And so we have to take this to heart, not only in how we actually do our research, but in how we train students. And because they're the ones that are going to come out and have either the, the, the science skills or the social skills or the technological skills um, to go out and solve the problems that we're currently not really creating, but we're embedded in. It's a sort of an unintentional con uh, consequence of our success, but at the same time, while we're creating these successes, we have to think ahead of, that, ahead of the game so that we can anticipate how we can sustain our society in a way that allows us to continue and preserve the natural resources that we've come to depend on. So, many people here think of us as a marine science institute, and that's really, really important, but I wanna just give you a few insights into some of the other tendrils in which we have our, our fingers you know, some of our, our reach, I should say, so that you understand the scope of how we're training students and how we're investing critical university resources. We're supporting people who are trying to turn organic matter, organic waste, generated from food, into alternative forms of energy. A couple of examples. We're funding someone in the chemistry department who's trying to develop novel catalysts that can turn organic waste into formic acid for use in fuel cells to power small vehicles. On the flip side of it, we're training a different suite of students to take organic material, organic waste, and use biological catalysts, and that would be something that looks very much like a house fly, to turn that into an organic battery that doesn't have the typical um, toxics associated with it that preserve, that create a waste problem when the battery's life is done. We have other people that we're helping to support and working with who are developing nanoparticles to put in membranes that are going to make desalination a more energy efficient process. <clears throat> and these are all novel technologies of significant environmental consequence born of our critical societal need that are going to allow us to progress in a way that sort of deconnects us or, or deconvolves some of the constraints that we've created um, through the normal pathways that we've gained energy and water and resources that we need. Um, probably closer to Tony's line of work, we're training students in how food systems work. Um, we're, there, we've developed a couple of systems on our island campus that uh, recirculate water that fish live in to grow plants, and then the plants then um, cleanse the water, and it's a closed system, and it's very cute. My um, spouse once called this an intimate form of sustainability, and I think it's true because you can build small systems and they can serve your house and they can serve your neighborhood. But what it does is it trains students in how food systems work and how nutrient cycles work, and it allows them to understand the choices that we have to make when we choose certain types of foods, when we prefer some forms of agriculture over others, these are critical questions that are, are facing our nation, and we need to make informed choices. And through these very simple exercises of training students how these systems work, we can help them not only make the right choices, but, but perhaps go out and innovate and join or form some of the companies that, that Tony has alluded to in his own line of work. 
On the other side of the equation, we're taking a number of our science students and we're training them to communicate their research more broadly so that they can make an impact in their society so that they can go talk to policymakers intelligently and actually affect change and justify why their research is globally important. Um, <clears throat> several of them have worked directly with members of Congress to affect or to help them understand climate change so that they can go work with their colleagues in Congress and convince them of certain forms of legislation. And this is a great success story for us because we're not only taking our science, but we're putting it out into public, into the hands of people who really, really need it. And we're also working with folks in our School of Cinematic Arts and in our School of Journalism to take these great communications tools that they have and we teach them about this human environment connection so that they can then go out and communicate the important environmental messages that we develop in very novel ways. And that's a very important part of our um, portfolio and it sort of helps amplify the message of how the humans and, and, and the environment relate to one another and how we can then further impact sustainable behaviors and thinking. So in essence, we're helping to train today's students to become tomorrow's problem solvers by giving them a very diverse tool set and really helping them understand the interconnectedness and the complexity of many of the environmental challenges that we face. We're doing it here so that when they graduate, they can not only go out and get important and relevant jobs, but they can go out and make important and relevant choices. So, you know, we read the mission statement at the beginning of, um, of uh, Phil's introduction, and while it's not 140 characters, I wish that it was, um, it's still really important because it emphasizes knowledge and it emphasizes stewardship and it emphasizes community, but it also has to anticipate and embrace larger problems and bring a new kind of intellect and a new kind of ingenuity to solve. So while I've gone sort of all global and earthy and water and energy on you, I still want to emphasize that the marine environment is a very, very important part of our mission, and it's just important as it was 20 years ago. Why? Because the ocean occupies 70% of the Earth. It plays a large role in our local and global environment. It's really important in Southern California. Um, it's part of our fabric, it's part of our community, and there's still much to be learned. And I'll give you a great example. 20 years ago, it's hard to believe 20 years ago, nobody really understood what ocean acidification was. And ocean acidification is this process that occurs as a result of the extra carbon dioxide that's been uh, put into the atmosphere through combustion of fossil fuels. Carbon dioxide simply diffuses into the ocean and it ever so slightly changes the chemistry. But it changes the chemistry in a way that might be harmful to a number of forms of marine life. Big things that we care about, like oysters and sea urchins, but also plankton that are really important to our global elemental cycles. And it's a big unknown for us. It's not clear whether or not this is going to be devastating for our oceans or whether or not our ecosystems will somehow adapt. And as a result of this uncertainty, our federal government, our state and local governments, and the research community have devoted enormous <coughs> effort to understanding this problem. And I'm really delighted and proud to say that USC scientists have been front and center on the leading edge of studying this problem and figuring out what the likely problems and possible solutions will be. Um, and that's not just the present environment, but where as well, the paleo environment as well. Will works on looking at things like, has have similar events occurred in the past? And if so, what was the response? So just this week, we had a great discovery. Some of our Wrigley uh, scientists reported that some organisms, like sea urchins, actually have a way to adjust their physiology. They change the amount of energy that they devote to protein metabolism, and it allows them to cope with some of the stresses that ocean acidification imposes. In this particular case, acidification can make it hard to make a shell. And that's a big deal if you're an organism that depends on a shell for surviving. So if you can change your physiology and make a shell, because that's critical for your protection, then you're going to be better off. 
And what that says is that there might be other organisms that have the same talent, if that's what you want to call it, and that our ecosystems and the organisms within them that we really depend on may actually be able to adapt to the changes that, that we have imposed through our own activities. And so the message there is that our core expertise in marine science is just as important now as it was 20 years ago because there's so much to be learned and the ocean is a very important part, not only of our heritage, but of how the world works. So where do we go from here? We have to continue to reach across disciplinary divides that, and we have to really consider not just the impact of the environment on us, but how we interact with it, because those connections are very much in force, and there are a lot of feedbacks that we have to learn about and consider. And I think that's always been apparent, but it's more apparent now than ever. We also have to recognize that these social institutions, as well as our natural science prowess and technological innovation, are all parts of solving the environmental equation. You can't have one without the other and the Wrigley Institute has to bring all of them together so that we can make progress and move forward. And then the third thing that we have to do is we have to continue to provide the forum for collaboration. I think the Boone Center for Science and Environmental Leadership was really important for that. It's been incredibly successful. Tony has so much to do with that, and, and I literally, I, I, I could kiss the ground that you walk on for all the incredible success that, that, that this has brought and will continue to bring. It's, been, it's a fantastic place and we're very lucky as a marine laboratory to have such a stellar facility that goes beyond our marine mission. But we have another project um, and that is to create a Boone-like center but for one that emphasizes faculty and student collaboration in a research intensive setting. Because if we're gonna train the next generation of students, we want them to have that highly collaborative, very interdisciplinary, intensive place where they can focus and they can learn about other disciplines and they can see it in a hands-on way so that we can get them out into our world, into our institutions, and into our society so that they can solve our problems perhaps more quickly than we will. So what this really is, is not only a call to help us raise funds to build this building on our Marine Science Center, but what it really is, is that I haven't had a roof wedding party yet, and I don't have any room, and so I'm counting on my, our supporters to really help us move into the future um, and de develop this great new facility that's going to help us carry our mission even further. Um, so before I stop um, and, uh, and take questions with Tony, there's a, a couple of um, acknowledgments that I want to make. Um, first of all, uh, Tony's absolutely correct in acknowledging not just the people who are here, but the people who could no longer be with us um, in helping to build the Wrigley Institute, the facilities on the Wrigley Green Science Center, and the incredible interconnected um, institute that we have on main campus. Um, and for that, um, it, I'm incredibly grateful. Um, we also have um, with us a very special guest. Where's Sandy? There she is. Okay, so uh, Sandy Burdick's daughter, Vicki, was probably one of our star students at the Wrigley Institute and did all of her dissertation work at the Wrigley Green Science Center. And uh, Vicki traveled to Germany where she had a prestigious research uh, position and then she was a postdoc at Harvard University when she tragically passed away from breast cancer. And, and Sandy was kind enough to endow a scholarship in Vicki's honor so that uh, Vicki's legacy can be carried on and we now have a verdict scholarship. for giving her a round of applause because it's people like her that really help us make a difference and not only for our mission but for the lives of students. So with that I'll turn off the mic and we'll take questions.
when somebody comes to you and says, you were instrumental in the development of the Wrigley Institute, and now it's blank. How do you answer that? <laughs> the question. She's asked, uh, 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 it's 2025, and somebody comes up to you and says that yeah, uh, uh, you, were instrumental. you were instrumental in starting the Wrigley Institute, and now it's blank. You know, what is the Wrigley Institute in 2025? Where do we see it going? Well, I would say that, that, that we are still continuing on this evolution of how you make the scholarship and the training that universities do make the most difference in the <coughs> that we have and the quality of the future that we leave for our kids and grandkids. And, uh, and, uh, and I think that, that what we want to see is that you take ever harder problems and you solve them. You train people to be leaders in implementing those solutions. You create the companies that are going to be driving those things forward and use the positive effects of the market to create that outcome. And that you've got this great tradition of, of, of success in those areas. And here's the roadmap for the big, hard problems that have yet to be done. <laughs> What he said. No, <laughs> no I, I would agree. I think I think our greatest, um, you know, in, in approximate way, um, our, our a great success is to um, really building on that interdisciplinary expertise and institutionalizing it in such a way that on the USC campus we never think about silos again. That there's a seamless integration of thought. Because the interdisciplinary that you learn about in environmental problem solving is the same kind of interdisciplinarity that oceanographers have. And it is, I mean, if you're in the tech world, you constantly have to be thinking about different ways of doing things. Every aspect of what we do um, requires that we stretch our minds more, but also at some level have, have depth of understanding. And you need that to create the kinds of people that, that Tony is talking about. So. Um, I, I would agree with what, what Tony said, and I just uh, would like to see that really embodied in the university so that nobody has to think about it as being something novel, that it just is. And, and just to play off of that, there's a really key thing that she just said. There's a reason this came out of green science. When you study things in the ocean, you just can't compartmentalize them. I'm a biologist, right? So I study biology. Well, my biology is floating around in an ocean. It's moving up and down and circling. And the physics is critically important to the success of my biology. The chemistry, the dynamics of the chemistry, my plant doesn't eat, my animal is excreting. What happens to that all depends on the chemistry of the sea. The interaction between the soils and the microbes and the waters are all critically dependent. You just know, you can't from the get-go ignore all those other things. It's always, and marine scientists have always had to, to live in that world, or you did a stupid thing, or you did a crappy job as a scientist. And so when you think about how interdisciplinary work emerges in academia, we had, it's no accident that marine labs and, and marine programs really led the way in thinking about interdisciplinary scholarship, because we had no choice. But where we lagged behind was people. You know, we just love going on our boats, doing our work, and you know, it was pretty easy to just sort of do our interdisciplinary scholarship. But how do you connect outside that? How do you deal with the policy environment, the social environment, all those communication issues, and everything, the, the 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 humanities, the passion? Why do people love the ocean? You know, and it, it's we were able to ignore that for a while, and that's when we merged the, the incredible interdisciplinary scholarship and the sciences that marine science had figured out with this incredible connection to people that environment programs have figured out, that's when a new generation of environment programs was born. And it really is, though, you couldn't have done it without marine science and other places like the Rick Institute. I just have to add that uh, it's one of these strange cross connections that you wouldn't think about unless you were deep in the sciences. But oceanographers have mathematical models to predict behaviors of organisms. And they're the same models that people use to um, predict social behavior. And the same mathematical formulation, different variables within them. But there's, there's crazy overlap, and we just have to bring the skill sets together because there, there's a lot of like thinking. It's just a matter of bringing it to the same place. Sure, go ahead. Yeah. 
being a marine theme, um, like the Earth, cruise ships became massively bigger, more people. Just this last week, one went back to port in San Diego because of the pandemic. Where do you see our society to that point? Cruise ships having to turn around and going back. Well, it's a two-edged sword, right? Okay, we love the ocean to death. You know, the, we always thought the oceans were so big that, you know, what can you do to the oceans? Well, we're starting to realize we can't do things. And, and, but you want people to love it. You want people to see the world. You want them to experience it. And, and I mean, some of this is a practical management thing. You've just got to manage how people are there in contact and, you know, epidemiology of, of, of infectious diseases. I mean, there, there's ways to just manage those boats better so that you, these illnesses don't happen. But I think there is this bigger issue, is we want you know, Antarctica, you know? So many people, it's an amazing place, an amazing place, right? Uh, I can tell you stories about Antarctica, and you all want to go there. Well, what do we need everybody on the planet to go to Antarctica? It's a pristine kind of place. But you want to hold people back from experiencing something on the planet that would make them love it even more. And, and it's a real challenge with uh, with the sea. And, and you know, I, I used to give this talk about about uh, about uh, uh, geo uh, geoengineering. You know, this idea that you, you can fertilize certain kinds of life in the sea and it'll draw greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere. Right? And it's a very controversial thing. Do you go out there and manipulate on purpose the planet? And uh, and so so you know, when I would talk about the science of that, people would get so upset. How can you go out there and you're going to just go out there and tweak the planet and you know change the ecology of the sea just to pull these gases out of the atmosphere and you know do you know what you're doing and how are you going to make who's going to make that decision and and so I just love the fact that you you're so passionate because you know Jacques Cousteau worked you know you you you, you think the oceans are so special that you're going to fight to the death to keep us from from screwing around with it and then. You're going to get out of this lecture hall, and you're going to get in your SUV, and you're going to drive it away. <laughs> and you're going to emit those greenhouse gases that are going in and acidifying the ocean. You know, where does that connection come in? You know, you gotta, you gotta. You, we want people to love it, and I think this education about the sea has created this generate, you know, generations that have a passion. You guys all, you know, you're pre-selected. You had other ways that you got connected, but a lot of people really disproportionately love the ocean for how often they experience it. But at the same time, how do you feed that? You know, Catalina, this is, I think, one of the amazing things of all the Channel Islands. You know, Catalina gets 1.2 million visitors a year, all the rest get 50,000, you know? The challenge is to manage an island with 1.2 million visitors a year to an extremely high conservation state so that people can enjoy it and so that the ecosystem can have all those special qualities that you want. You don't want to put a fence around and keep it blind. And that, again, is sort of the special vision of the Catalina Conservancy is that it makes that we want people to have that experience, but you got to manage it like crazy if they're all coming. So, uh, just, a, just to add to this just a little bit, um, one of the discussions that I'm having in one of my National Research Council committees um, is on the topic of sustainability. We've been talking about it for the last 15 or 20 years. As an academic community, what progress have we made and where do we need to go next? And so they have you know, people who are uh, interested in terrestrial ecology and industrial agriculture and um, life cycle uh, processes and, you know, all walks of the sustainability discussion. And I'm the ocean person. And so they, they're they talking about, well, how do we organize this discussion? You know, we have these critical questions that we want to discuss. How do we do it? And somebody piped up and said, well, let's do it around communities. Like, yeah, we can do this kind of community and that kind of community and consider all the social infrastructure around them. And if I, there's the equivalent of raising your hand on a telecon. I said, excuse me, there are no communities in the middle of the ocean. There are large marine e ecosystems that are globally important from which we get resources, we get fish, we get oxygen and all kinds of things. They're critical, they're not represented by your community structure, but they're really critical. So how do, you, so it was a couple of things. Number one, the fact that my fellow scientists weren't really thinking about the fact that this big part of the planet didn't have a community to represent it. But it's a more global problem in that most people just think the ocean is out there. And the more that we can connect them to what the ocean is and does, 
the better off we are. Yes. Considering the cast, I want to thank you for the family camps that you had. Yeah. Um, because of those, I, it changed the way I buy the shrimp. So I'm at Sprouts the other day. I did buy the one from Indonesia. I bought the one from Mexico. So yeah, I would have never known that at a um, camp, among other things. So it's a very enjoyable experience. And I learned a lot. The future, um, something I don't know if you should talk about is, but now across the harbor they're going to start the Dock One project at some point. And I, I'm just hoping that's still on track. And um, when can we see some movement on that project? Uh, okay, so I am. Um as Allison indicated, I'm the president of the Southern California Marine Institute, which is actually the consortium of universities that are slated to move into this facility that was previously called City Dock One, is now called Alta Sea. And they are in an aggressive fundraising campaign to build that facility out to be uh, a sort of urban education and research center. And I believe their target for opening is three or four years from now. But it should be a spectacular thing, and, and we do have a little bit of a legacy here. I mean, when those uh, uh, conversations first started, you know, a bunch of us talked about what that could look like and put some ideas together and sent it over to Geraldine, who's That's sitting right. right behind you there. And uh, she was the head of the Port of L.A. And, and, uh, and two days later, she sent a glossy brochure, Screen Science Center at City Dock No. <laughs> she had encapsulated all this academic text and put it into this beautiful vision for, for what that could become as another, another vehicle for really connecting the science and the, 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 the needs of society. And, uh, and I think it would be a spectacular thing. The Anne Marie Foundation is very uh, 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 excited about the book. And it'll be a great collaborative partner for Southern California really focusing on our reports play such a critical role. Over here. Hi. Um, I've always been a lover of the ocean, and being here tonight is such a real treat. And I'm wondering if either of you two have had any experience with research with the great Pacific garbage patch, and you know, all that trash, little tiny plastics breaking down, and what's that doing to our ecosystem, and what's going on in the world with that? So I, I will I will admit I don't have very much experience with the Great Pacific um, Ocean Garbage Patch. Um, I did see a talk about it um, not too long ago by a gentleman named Dave Carl, who's an eminent uh, microbial ecologist who works a lot in big ocean processes and microbial processes, and and he has discovered that the Great Garbage Patch is I mean the, the, the plastic does break down, it gets smaller and smaller, but it definitely changes the microbiology of the oceanic region and how the ecosystems work in that area. I think that, that I was going to quote Dave Carl too, he's a, a good guy. Um, what you see in all the papers is a great PR move to look at those high tide, king tides on the islands and all the plastics that float off and take pictures of it and, and intimate that that's what's in the middle of the sea, and, and it's not. It's these microparticles, they're doing sort of a, 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 a fairly unknown and interesting thing to the microbiology, but I actually wouldn't worry about that as much as a whole variety of other big things that are going on. Uh, it does really affect uh, seabird populations. So seabirds pick at, at shiny things, and so when you're in albatrosses and stuff like that, and that's probably the biggest sort of biological effect of those particles as they break down. But the real issue is these microplastics. And, um, and I just don't, I don't see that as being as compelling as many of the other big issues. It's not that we want to ignore it, but it's not as compelling as many of the other big issues that, uh, that we face. But man, it's such great PR moves to take pictures of all those big floating streams of plastic and then intimate that that's an area the size of North America or Texas or something or out there. Or or <laughs> <laughs> one, one more question. The Wrigley Institute chair, let's say Woods Hole and Scrubs. What makes the Wrigley Institute unique from these other 
are very large institutions that propose that they do the same thing to you. Okay, well, first of all, um, uh, I'm sorry? Couldn't hear it for the question. Oh, the question is what makes the Wrigley Institute different or unique relative to places like Woods Hole or Scripps Institution of Oceanography? And, you know, they are slightly different institutions. Um, Scripps and Woods Hole are sort of full-fledged oceanographic institutions um, that have, uh, they have a much broader mandate, they have a much larger faculty, um, and um, the Wrigley Institute differs in part because it's an environmental institute be that is, has a lot of oceanography in it, but it's also much broader. Um, it, its mandate is much more uh, environmental and cross-disciplinary, as we explained. But there's also a very unique character of what we have on Catalina Island that is not part of what you see at Woods Hole scripts because it really caters to the research scientists and the research environment. It emphasizes bringing people from all different universities, not just one. And so the collaborative potential, not just within marine science, but across all disciplines because many different disciplines use it, I think is much, much greater. I think that's right. The scripts, Woods Hole, there used to be the joy and the joyless institutions. The joint oceanographic <laughs> institutions were the 12 big institutions that got all the Navy money. And the joyless institutions were the ones that, uh, that uh, begged for the scraps. But, the, uh, but those were oceanogra oceanography programs. Science, they actually didn't even do the interdisciplinary as well as you could at, 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 at programs like the Wrigley Institute. But they were very focused on a few oceanographic questions. So that's one class of just oceanography. The Wrigley Institute went beyond that to say, why do we care about the oceans? What other parts of the oceans? What about the coasts? What about the living things in the sea? And how do we connect with people that care about that, take it beyond just doing the science? And still, very, very little work is done beyond just the scholarship itself and the writing of papers at those other institutions. They're trying. They're trying to catch up. I would say the other class that you have to think about, though, is the next generation of environment. And, and the one that I think is most profound is what they're doing at Arizona State University. And Michael Crow is the first university president that was an environmental studies major as, a, as an undergraduate. He has this in his bones. And it's the largest public university. It's, you know, it's the second tier institution in that state. You know, you're, uh, U of A, the Oxford of the, uh, of the West, you know, for both alums. Uh, but the um, uh, but Arizona State was always, you know, the poor cousin down the road, but it's a honking big cousin, right? 90,000 students. And, uh, and he has created something he calls the New American University that takes all the stuff we're talking about with the Wrigley Institute and says, you know, this isn't just an environment thing. This matters whether it's justice, whether it's governance and politics, whether it's, you know, all, all these other parts of our lives and health and everything else. you got to connect that university in a more real way to the rest of the planet. And he's kind of taken the Wrigley Institute model, and very, I mean, he put me on the board, he's put other people on the board that follow this model, because he's explicitly taking the Wrigley Institute model, saying, you know, the whole university should act like this. And, and I think that that's really the, you know, the Wrigley Institute is this model for how you go beyond just the scholarship. The big ocean science programs, they're about the scholarship. Even a lot of the marine labs are just about the scholarship. The Wrigley Institute was to go beyond just the scholarship itself. How do you change the world? How do you change our lives? And to develop in parallel with the scholarship the kinds of programs that make that scholarship matter. And, uh, and, and the other institutions have a harder time doing that. The Wrigley Institute's done it very well. But there are some people now that are taking it to another level. And it's an exciting thing to watch as this sort of then gets into the rest of the culture. And there's a brand new book out by Michael Crow on what the future of universities are. And if you look through it, you'll see threads of the Wrigley Institute all through that, you know, that, that he learned watching us, and now he's trying to tell everybody else this is what the university of the future should look like.
2,000 vehicles in the case of three jobs. And the development of what the market will do quickly in response to something, to compare something that's quite astounding. And at a research level, the fact that you're addressing the absolute desertification of the ocean, where everybody knows very much about global warming, but not many people really think about what's going on with the ocean, is huge. Because we all recognize that we all come from the sea. And that's where our passion is more about this. It's an inborn type of thing. And I think that we're doing it with really leadership, cutting edge, and congratulations. Thank you all very much for coming tonight. Roberta, Tony, and everybody that's been a part of it, thank you so much. And uh, for a wonderful evening. Thanks again, Nancy. And, and have a good, good evening. Thank you very much.